Benzocaine is a commonly used local anesthetic which can be found in a lot of over-the-counter medications. It can be pretty easily made from something called PABA which was actually used for a long time as the active ingredient in sunscreen. However, due to some health issues it fell out of favor and it's not really used anymore. You'll probably notice that benzocaine has the same cane suffix as cocaine. However, the only thing that the cane suffix really denotes is that it's a local anesthetic. The structures of local anesthetics are pretty variable, but they all have the same overall design. Each local anesthetic has a hydrophilic end and a lipophilic end which are connected by either an ester or an amide linkage. Lipophilic literally means fat friendly, and this end likes to dissolve in things like fats and oils, and hydrophilic means water friendly, and this end likes to dissolve in water. The final piece is the structure that holds these two different ends together. In local anesthetics, this linkage involves structures known as esters or amides. So now knowing the overall structure of local anesthetics, let's take a look at the common ones and see if we can notice each piece. So at first glance, the structures seem pretty variable, but I've decided to be nice and I've gone ahead and color coded each section. From this chart, you can see that it's not really viable to convert one local anesthetic to another. I also want to make it extremely clear that you can't convert benzocaine to cocaine or any other illicit drug. On top of this, don't attempt to eat or consume benzocaine because it has a large history of actually poisoning people. Even legally obtained topical ointments of benzocaine have caused life-threatening effects in people. Anyway, for now I'm going to move on and quickly mention how they work. And I'm going to do this explanation by going into as little detail as possible. To start off, we're going to have to know a little bit of information about nerve cells to understand how a local anesthetic works. Nerve cells maintain the inside of the cell more negative than the outside. This is mainly controlled by keeping the concentration of sodium ions in the cell low compared to that outside the cell. When the nerve cell wants to send a signal, it opens these little things called sodium channels and it allows the sodium ions to diffuse into the cell. This happens really quickly and it ultimately leads to a signal being sent. The function of the local anesthetic is pretty simple and it basically just blocks the sodium channel. Then, when the nerve wants to send a signal, it tries to open the sodium channels, but no sodium comes in and no signal is sent. This leaves your nerve cell sad and alone with no means of communication. And we sense this lack of communication from our nerve cells as the feeling of being numb. Anyway, I hope the intro wasn't too long, and I hope you enjoyed the little bit of biochemistry at the end. So, for the synthesis, I used 200 milliliters of anhydrous ethanol. 25 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid, and about 20 grams of PABA. If you don't have anhydrous ethanol, you can also use 95% ethanol, but your yield isn't going to be as good. I started out by adding about 20 grams of PABA. To the PABA, I poured in 200 milliliters of anhydrous ethanol that I made in a previous video. I start the stirring, and then I start to add in the sulfuric acid. I added in a total of about 25 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. It's very, very important to add it slowly with a lot of stirring because its addition will generate a lot of heat. Eventually it became too thick for the stir bar to work, so I had to take it off the stand and mix it manually. I continue to add small amounts of sulfuric acid at a time with quite a bit of mixing in between. As more sulfuric acid is added, the mixture heats up and it becomes more and more important to add it slowly. If too much is added at a time, the sulfuric acid can cause the mixture to boil which can result in some dangerous splashing. So once we're all done adding, I put it back on the stand and I wash some of the ground glass joint with some ethanol to clean it. The next thing that we need to do is set up the reaction for a reflux. The reflux allows us to heat the solution to the boiling point of ethanol, but without losing any of the solvent. So you can see above the flask I've set up the nice beautiful condenser that I got. I attach it to a cold water circulator, and this way all of the ethanol should recondense and fall back into the flask. 
Underneath the reaction flask, I put an oil bath and we start heating it up. As the mixture heats up, everything will slowly dissolve and it will eventually become a nice clear solution. It will fully clear up and start to boil at about the same time. If you look above, you can actually see the ethanol vapors and you can see the ethanol that's recondensed and dripping back into the reaction flask. So now that we're refluxing, we start the timer and we let it run for about 90 minutes. In general, if you heat up a reaction, it's going to go to completion faster. Unfortunately in our case, this is an equilibrium reaction, so completion means when the reaction reaches equilibrium. I'm not exactly sure where the equilibrium lies, but usually 60 to 90 minutes at reflux is enough to get there. The reaction taking place is called a Fischer esterification and the overall scheme is shown above. With sulfuric acid acting as the catalyst, the PABA will react with the ethanol to form benzocaine and water. The new bond that's formed in the benzocaine is known as an ester and unfortunately under these acidic conditions, it can react with water and be hydrolyzed. When the benzocaine is hydrolyzed, it will reform the ethanol and the PABA. So you can see how this can cause the reaction to just bounce back and forth between these molecules. Using what's known as Le Chatelier's principle, we can alter some of the reaction conditions to make the equilibrium position more favorable and more towards the products. For us, the easiest thing to do is to increase the concentration of the reactants and to decrease the concentration of the products. Logically, if there's more reactants to go forward, it will favor the forward reaction, and if there's fewer products to go backwards, that'll also favor the forward reaction. Increasing the concentration of the reactants is extremely easy, and we do this by adding a large excess of ethanol. In my case, I actually did nothing to reduce the concentration of the products, but if I were to, I would have targeted water. The two easiest ways to do this is by molecular sieves or using a Dean Stark apparatus. The molecular sieves are pretty simple enough and they simply absorb water as it forms. The Dean Stark apparatus collects and condenses a small amount of vapors that come off the reaction and when they separate into a water layer or an organic layer, we can selectively drain off the water. However, unfortunately this only works for solvents that are immiscible and in our case it wouldn't work for ethanol and water. I actually don't own a Dean Stark apparatus right now, but I do plan to buy one soon and when I do, I'll make a video on how it's used. Once the 90 minutes have passed, we take our reaction flask out of the oil and we let it cool. Once it was relatively cool, I decanted it off into a nice broken beaker. The round bottom flask was washed a few times with small amounts of ethanol. Equipped with a stirring rod, we slowly add saturated sodium bicarbonate solution. You can see that the moment it's added, it will start to bubble as CO2 is produced. The sodium bicarbonate will react with any sulfuric acid as well as PABA that remains. Remember that this is an equilibrium reaction, so there's likely quite a bit of PABA that's actually left. By adjusting the pH to be slightly basic, we'll also liberate our free base benzocaine, which will precipitate out. Our goal here is to keep adding the bicarbonate until we reach a pH of about 8. It's important not to neutralize it too quickly and to stir in between because it does have a pretty big tendency of foaming over. As you continue to add more, it might start to get a little bit cloudy as benzocaine starts to fall out of solution. When the benzocaine starts to fall out of solution, the pH is probably very close to 8. It's not really important to test the pH because using a bicarbonate solution, you're not really going to get higher than 8 anyway. So adding too much bicarbonate solution really is not an issue or a worry. Anyway, just for good measure, we test the pH and we can see that it is indeed around 8. So in the end, we have what looks like nice white snowy benzocaine precipitate. To separate it off, it can either be gravity filtered or vacuum filtered. I opted to vacuum filter just because it's much faster. So before we do anything, we wet the filter paper a little bit. We then pour in and filter off our benzocaine. The beaker can be washed a few times with water to get any remnants of the benzocaine that's left behind. 
The benzocaine that's filtered off is also washed a few times just to clean it up a little. After washing it a few times, it was dried under vacuum for about a minute. After it's dried for a little bit, we can flip over our Buchner funnel and we can see what we got. What we're left with is some damp, nearly pure benzocaine that I will dry in the oven. If you like, you could recrystallize the benzocaine, but I think it's pretty pure at this point and not really necessary. After drying it in the oven, we're left with some very nice powdered benzocaine. The yield was about 15 grams, and in percentage, that is about 70%. From this yield, we can kind of assume that the point of the equilibrium is around 70% towards the products. Again, I could have in theory used molecular sieves to pick up water and push the equilibrium point closer to 100%. For quick storage, I just put it in a Ziploc bag and labeled it as benzocaine. I should note that it's probably not the best idea to store a white powder that can numb you in a plastic bag. Anyway, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the next one. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next. Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Anyway, that's all for now and I'll see you on the next one.